Okay, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dean Lane. I'm the Vice President uh, in charge of the Cyber Intelligence Initiative here at the Institute of World Politics. And I've been asked um, to make the introduction uh, of Mr. Jack Tomarchio. Did I get that right? I think I got it right. Um, so just to start off, he uh, began his career as a judge advocate corps, so that's a, a lawyer in the Navy, or, or the Marine Corps? Army. Army. Okay. Um, okay, Navy. What, okay, the bet is on, okay, because I'm a Navy guy. Airborne, though, so. Um, and, and he was with the 82nd Airborne, so uh, this man jumps out of airplanes. I'd just like to make that clear. Um, and he retired from the Army in 2010. Uh, when he came out, uh, he was uh, a permanent rank of colonel, okay? So uh, that's the, the Silver uh, Eagles. Um, and he also served on Romney's, um, Mitt Romney's national security team, which um, kind of set him up to do some other things. In 2005, he was appointed to, to be the first deputy principal, principal deputy assistant secretary for Homeland Security. So that, that's kind of a big deal when you're first guy and, and, uh, and then you get to shape everything. So he's, you know, probably many of the things that he put into place during that time are still in place. Um, and then in 2007, he was promoted so he did a good job, uh, to Principal Dep Deputy Undersecretary for Intelligence and Analysis Operations. So they, they brought him up because of, of what he was doing. Um, today, uh, and Jack is a principal with Agogi Group. Agogi Group? Okay, got that wrong. Um, and that is an international um, and strategic advisory uh, firm, and they address companies and governments all over the world. I mean, you can imagine with his background, um, we're fortunate to have him here today. Okay, and then finally, he has uh, a number of degrees, uh, a BA uh, from, um, and that was a cum laude from Penn State. Okay, Penn State is no slouch school. And um, a Juris Doctorate from the Vermont Law School, a Master's of Government and Administration from the University of Pennsylvania, and a Master's of Strategic Studies uh, from the U.S. Army War College. So um, please help me welcome Mr. Jack. Okay, yeah, I still got it right. Okay. Okay, I'll get out of the way. Thank you. Uh, clicker. Okay. Well, first of all, I want to apologize for being late. Um, I came in from Philadelphia, and um, because it's 106 out there, um, the the trains, the Amtrak trains, do not run on time. They run very slowly, and all the trains are backed up. So the Northeast Corridor, and it is what it is. So again, my apologies. Um, my uh, my my 950 1058 train did not leave until uh, about uh, um, I think it was like. 20 minutes to 12 or something like that or something. So, and I had a rush down here. So again, my apologies. Um, I'm really pleased to be here today. Uh, today is not July the 18th, it's July the 20th, um, but that's okay. Um, we'll just pretend it's the 20th. Um, uh, thank you very much, Dean, for that very uh, nice introduction. Um, and I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, uh, something that's kind of in the news and it seems to never go away. And uh, I, I call this the cyber campaign uh, of 2016. And we're now into 2017, we're halfway through the year, and we should be leaving this problem behind us, but it seems like, it's kind of like eczema, you know, it just stays with you, it's like a bad case, it's a rash. Um, and uh, so I want to talk a little bit about that, but before I do that, I want to, I want to tell you, uh, I want to ask you to help me out and help yourselves out. Um, I'm going to try and talk to you about um, the Russian cyber hacking issue on a much grander scale than what we read about in the paper. And I, I want to tell you this, and I want you to, at some point, suspend reality a little bit as we go through this, um, because what I want to teach you is not just some of the facts, but I want to teach you how to look at this issue through the eyes of an intelligence officer, 
through the optic of someone in the United States intelligence community. Um, and I also want to teach you how to look at this through the eyes and through the optic of a Russian. And more importantly, how to look at this through the eyes and the optic of a Russian intelligence officer. Because the, the man that leads Russia today is a Russian intelligence officer, was a KGB case officer, Vladimir Putin. So uh, I think that's really interesting to do that because I think by doing that, you'll get a better appreciation of how this all happened so and, and why it happened. And it's really more, to me, the more important part is why it happened. And I think we can answer that by looking at through the eyes of the Russians. So I want to talk about the first thing is the current problem or the current issue, which you all know about pretty much. It's the issue of the cyber hack that took place in 2016. So this will be kind of like uh, an unclassified threat briefing. Um, and, and that's just the little private threat briefing kind of thing. So as we go through this, uh, what was the problem? How did this all start? Well, this all started um, back in the summer, July, a year ago, 2016. The Democrats were in my hometown, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and they were getting ready to pick their candidate, Hillary Clinton, to run against the Republican candidate. Um, and in doing so, there was a lot of hoopla. Everybody was happy, you know, big thing. Probably Democrats are going to pick their, their person. And then in the middle of this celebration, someone came in and was a party pooper. And it was a, a, something called WikiLeaks. And what happened was uh, a news story broke in July 2016, indicating that uh, at first 18,000 emails were released through a group called WikiLeaks. And you know what WikiLeaks is. I'm sure you've all heard about that. Anybody not heard about WikiLeaks? Okay, good. You're not going to admit it anyway. Um, so WikiLeaks uh, is kind of gets the, 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 the blame, so to speak, for releasing 18,000 emails. And these are emails that come from the Democratic National Committee. These are emails that indicate uh, and talk about communications within the, 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 the confines of these party operatives. And these in emails are pretty interesting because they seem to indicate a bias within the DNC and among DNC operatives in favor of the Clinton campaign as opposed to the Sanders campaign. Remember, Hillary Clinton did have an opponent, Bernie Sanders. And as as the press begins to dissect these emails, they see such things as um, scurrilous comments about Bernie Sanders, scurrilous comments about his wife, uh, criticism of his religion, um, actual questions as to whether he is in fact he's Jewish. Is, is he really Jewish or is he really an atheist? Um, and then there's even further emails that come out. And these are the emails of a guy named John Podesta. Um, that comes out a little bit later, and he's the campaign manager for Hillary Clinton. And the emails also seem to be emails between folks in the DNC and lawyers and people that work on the Clinton campaign. And as the press reports, these emails not only say all these scurrilous things, but they also seem to indicate and, and they show a discussion of tactics being discussed between Clinton campaign people and DNC people on ways to beat Bernie Sanders. Now, one might say, well, that's this politics, no big deal. But caveat, the DNC is supposed to be neutral in this game. Their job is to elect a Democrat into the White House following President Obama. Their job is not to is to theoretically, not to theoretically connive to try and get a certain Democrat over another Democrat. They're supposed to be almost agnostic, as long as it's a Democrat. So we begin to see this, this very kind of embarrassing, um, uh, I guess you'd call it a, a, a trail of emails indicating that the DNC may be not so neutral as we thought they were. And as a result of the fallout of that, um, this woman here, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, the chairman of the DNC, has to fall on her sword. She resigns. She resigns in 2016 as, as the head of the Democratic National Committee. And as I said, there's also even further group of emails that come out, also from WikiLeaks, related to this gentleman here. That's John Podesta, who's the campaign manager for Hillary Clinton. And it's an interesting picture. He's actually holding Russian rubles. Uh, I don't know why he would 
even pose with the picture of him holding Russian rubles, but maybe he was having, you know, maybe he has a good sense of humor and thought it was funny. Uh, Podesta had a real interesting quote. He said, in my 50 years of being involved in the political process and on countless and countless numbers of um, political campaigns, I have had to fight very tough Democrats, or very tough Republicans, nasty Republicans, but I've never had to go against the Russian intelligence service. So it's it's kind of a big deal. Well, she's gone. He's embarrassed. And the 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 WikiLeaks fingerprints seem to in, go, go back to something a little bit more nefarious. I'll get to that in a minute. When, uh, when this all breaks, the U.S. intelligence community begins to get involved. And uh, they go out and actually... Uh, get some forensic cyber people, in fact, two companies, a company called CrowdStrike and another company called Mandiant, to come in and take a look at the hack. And what they find is some pretty interesting information. The first thing they find is that the hack of the DNC uh, took place not in July of 2016 or May of 2016. In fact, these hacks took place as early as the spring of 2016. 15. And so the, the intruders were actually in the DNC system over a year before they were detected. And there's a couple things there. First of all, they also find that the DNC had been warned by the FBI no more than nine or 11 times that you better check your, the security of your internet communications, of your emails, because we think and we see that they are very, very, very fragile and very porous. In fact, one gentleman said, you could have gotten into the DNC with a rusty can opener. It was that bad. The DNC did nothing. They just did nothing for whatever reason. Maybe they didn't want to spend the money. Maybe they didn't really care about it. Maybe it was somebody else's job and he didn't do it. Um, so anyway, so what they find is that somebody's been lurking in there since 2015. In fact, two somebodies have been lurking in there since 2015 and early 2016. And as they start to get into this, they realize that the, 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 the forensic fingerprints left behind by the intruders have the hallmarks of the Russian intelligence service. And I'm going to get to that in a minute. And when that comes out, the Russians reply, Valery Peshkov, Sergei Peshkov, Sergei Peshkov, who is a spokesman for Vladimir Putin, responds in one word, Musa. Does anybody know what that means? Garbage. Absolutely. Garbage. R rubbish. Oops. There you go. Sorry about that. Oh, well. I hope that's not an antique. Um, <laughs> so, um, well, at least I have this water here. So, he responds that it's essentially rubbish, okay? And as a result of that, the Russians now go on the defensive. They're saying, in fact, they release a statement saying, well, wait a minute, the Americans shouldn't be pointing fingers at us. In fact, Mr. Peshkov says every single day, Vladimir Putin's uh, communications, his email, his server is breached by hundreds of attackers coming directly from Langley. And you know what Langley means. That's, that's another word for the CIA, CIA headquarters, Langley, Virginia. So there's, there's already this tit for tat kind of thing going on. Now, the other thing that's found out is that not only was the DNC attacked, but that up to 24 other states, and now it's probably like 42 other states, up to 24 other states have had their own state machines, their own state voting machines breached or at least probed. And in two cases, in two states in particular, Arizona and Illinois, the, the breach is all clean up. I don't mind. I, I used to be a janitor. Um, the, uh, the breach is even more serious. So as we go into this, we find then that the Russians have their fingerprints all over this. And we find that as we go into this, that, as I said, the hallmarks seem to indicate that the Russians are involved. And as a matter of fact, there's actually two entities from the Russian intelligence service that are involved. And they, they give these two entities a, a code name. I couldn't do anything better. And the code name is Cozy Bear and Fancy Bear. And I couldn't find a Cozy Bear or I couldn't find a Fancy Bear. So I got this stalking bear here, which is kind of like the Russian bear stalking. And it's, it's the best I could do. Um, and Cozy Bear and Fancy Bear 
are the code names. But they actually, I'm going to have another one so I can, I can knock that over too. Thank you. Um, Cozy Bear and, and Fancy Bear are actually the code, name, code names for something called APT29, which stands for Advanced Persistent Threat 29, and APT28. Let's look at our friends at APT29. APT29 is, that's my Batman slide, a APT29 is, that's the, that's the uh, coat of arms of the GRU, the Russian Military Intelligence Service. Um, nothing special about them. The GRU have been around for a long time. Uh, we have military intelligence. We have naval intelligence. We have Air Force intelligence. So nothing really new there. Um, and uh, they've been involved in this hack. And in addition to these guys being involved, there's these guys. That's the FSB. And that's the coat of arms of the FSB. You would know them by their old name, the KGB. They changed their name. And they even changed their coat of arms. The old KGB coat of arms is the sword and the shield, like you see here, with the red Russian Soviet star superimposed, where you now see the double-headed Romanov eagle. So that is the, the FSB, and that is the, the GRU. And their fingerprints are all over that. Not only do they know that they're there, but they also determine that neither the FSB nor the GRU knew that the other was hacking into the DNC. And in fact, that is actually a trademark of Soviet or Russian spy tradecraft. The different intelligence services in Russia often compete with each other to get the best scoop, so to speak, the best intel. So we have a classic situation here of FSB and GRU competing against each other. So let's talk a little bit about this. And what happens now in the fall of 2016 is the Department of Homeland Security, that's my old department where I was an undersecretary, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and the DNI, the Director of National Intelligence, come out with a document called a triple seal document, which means it has the three seals, DHS, DNI, and FBI. And it's essentially saying that we three organizations, we three three-letter agency agencies, uh, concur that in fact the FSB and the GRU were very involved in this. And they go into even greater depth and they determine and they give evidence of what we have found with regard to what, why we think these two agencies from the, from the Russian state were involved in the breach. First of all, we see that, again, they're competing. We also know that the Russians have superb tradecraft. They're very, very good at espionage. They're very good at human espionage. They're very good at cyber espionage. They have sophisticated tools and sophisticated malware. They use, uh, they change their attack modalities to disguise their implants, and they modify their methods of attack to disguise detection and to avoid detection by people they're looking to, to identify them. We also know that their that their targets in this country are wide-ranging. For example, they have attacked the White House, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the Department of State, the Department of Defense, so the .mil and .gov sites, the Department of Energy, think tanks, academic institutions, maybe they've attacked right here, banks, research and development and technology industries, the insurance industry, and even uh, the, uh, the, the network of hospital systems around the country. They have not limited their targets to just the United States. They've been very active in targeting countries throughout Western Europe, Brazil, Canada, China, the old Soviet Georgia, Iran, Japan, Malaysia, to name just a few. We also find out that not only do these two organizations, FSB and GRU, compete and, and have tradecraft, we actually find out even more personal linkages. We note that the times when they are active, when they are actively breaching and attacking our sites, correspond to the working hours in Moscow, 8 to 5, 8 to 6, 9 to 5. We also find out that they have been and through our own, our own forensics and our own NSA work, we find out and are able to actually put identities on these people. 
were actually to figure out who these guys are. I mean, by name, because we're able to get into some of their systems. And we're able to see that, like everybody else, they have a life. And so while they might spend eight hours a day hacking into our systems, our .gov, our .mil, the DNC, they're also sending emails to each other. And they're complaining. Like one guy's complaining, you know, Sergey's complaining to Vasily that their boss, Yevgeny, is a jerk. And he, and, he, and he won't give him any time off. Or he's saying, you know, I need some time off because my wife, Svetlana, is mad at me because I'm not t- doing my part taking care of the kids back at, our, back at home in our apartment in Moscow. And they're actually seeing the, the ebb and flow of life of these guys. They're actually able to determine and identify that some of the actual computers, the terminals that these guys were working from, were the same terminals that were used to breach the German parliament in 2014. They leave those signatures. They're actually able to determine by the way these guys type that they can they can build a psychosocial profile. Give you an example. When I type an email, especially if I'm typing fast, I always misspell certain words because I'm just doing that, right? One of the words I misspell, it's a tough word, but I get it wrong, is the. I spell it H-T-E. H-T-E, H-T-E, H-T-E. Well, you know, Thank God for spell check, right? Because I have to go back and, and get go back to T-A-G. I misspell the word Philadelphia. I'm from Philadelphia. I was born there. I misspell it. It's like, I can't get it right. I'm just typing too fast. That's something we all have. That's part of your psychosocial profile, especially as you sit there. They can even determine, and they have determined, identities based on the amount of pressure you put on the keys. Some people are light. Other people are like, <laughs> And, and I'm kind of like that. <clears throat> so they can determine that and they, they can actually build a profile on who's, who's on, when they're on, well, how's his life, what's going on. So they find all this stuff and they say, this is pretty interesting. We've got, we've got some evidence here that the Russians are involved. And then they find something else that's kind of like the smoking gun. And it's really weird. Now, you know what code looks like? It's a bunch of numbers, right? Just numbers, numbers, numbers. Guys, coders, they write numbers all day. And they're looking through this code. And what do they see in the code? They see a sentence. And amidst all these numbers, all these digits, they see a sentence in Cyrillic. And this sentence is translated and it says, I am Felix Derzhinsky. L-O-L. Who's that? Is that the guy that's doing it? No. Who's Felix Derzhinsky? Felix Derzhinsky was the first head of the Cheka, the first intelligence service under the Soviet Union in 1919. He's not even a Russian. He's a Pole. And if you go to Moscow and you visit Derzhensky Square, which is where the KGB headquarters used to be, you kind of get it. So somebody in Russia implants this little sentence, I'm Felix Derzhensky. Ha 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 ha. Now why would they do that? You might say, well, they're really stupid. Well, that was, that's really dumb. That was a, a, that's, a, that's a breach of operational security. I would say no. It's not dumb. It's somebody basically saying, it's us. We did it. Yes, exactly. What does is, what is Mr. Putin like to do in the United States? He likes to thumb his nose at us. It's somebody saying, it's us. What are you going to do about it? Yeah, we did it. Ha ha. I'm Felix Derzhinsky. Get it? Ha ha. Inside joke? That's what I think it is. They're, they're too good to do something stupid like that. But they're certainly good enough to leave a little, you know, a little dig, a little dig. So we have that happening. And we now think here that this has happened as early as 2015. And we think about this whole cyber thing, and we put it in the, in the, in, in the prism of what the Director of National Intelligence, uh, Lieutenant General Jim Clapper, said. The Russian cyber threat is now more severe than we had previously assessed. He says that after this comes out. Now, we know the Russians collect on us, certainly. Matter of fact, they're not the only ones that collect on us. As a matter of fact, there's 137 countries that we know are active in cyberspace trying to steal our secrets, trying to steal our technology, trying to steal our intellectual property. 137. Who do you think is the number one purveyor of this? Wrong. Wrong. Good good tries, though. It's actually the Russians. The Russians. The Russians are, are probably the most prolific at it, 
and they're probably the, the best at it. The Chinese are also very good, but they're not as good as the Russians. The Russians have been at this business longer. They've actually been in the espionage business for, for, for like centuries. Before there was an FSB and a GRU, all the way back to the time of the czars, there was the Okhrana, the czar's secret police, the czar's intelligence service. They're the folks that were running operations around the world. They're the folks that were putting people like Joseph Stalin in the gulag. They were people who were recruiting people like Joseph Stalin to probably act as, uh, as informers to them to get rid of other undesirables that he wanted to get rid of. So we had the Okhrana, and it's followed by the Cheka in 1919. And then it becomes the NKVD in the 1920s and 30s. Then it becomes the KGB. We all know the KGB. And of course, there's our old friends, the GRU. Then it becomes the FSB, KGB changes to FSB, and then there's the SVR, the Foreign Intelligence Service, which is like our CIA, collecting overseas intelligence, usually human intelligence. And then in the future, there's going to be the, GM, the GMR, uh, the GMB, the GMB, which will be a new organization formed from a merger of the FSB, the GRU, and the SVR into like one super intelligence service which will have over 100,000 uh, officers and staffers. And this is something that Putin has already announced. So we know that the Russians are good at this. Now, we ask ourselves, well, why are they so good at it? A couple of reasons. One, they have a history of espionage, all going all the way back to the czars. Another reason is they've got really, really good people, very technically competent people. The Russians are good in technology. They're good in science. They're good in mathematics. And if you look at Russia, especially Russia post-Soviet Union, fall of Soviet Union, 1989, you see a country that in many cases has been, been beset by economic woes. And you see people graduating from prestigious institutions like Moscow State University with a PhD in electrical engineering and another PhD in computer network programming. And guess what they can't get? A job. They can't get a job. So some of these people say, well, look, I've, I've got all these degrees. I, I'm not leaving. I'm, I can't leave the country for whatever reason. I don't want to leave Russia. It's my home. How do I make a living with all this? They go over to the dark side. The dark side. They go into criminality. And they join something called the RBN. It stands for the Russian Business Network. That's a euphemism for the Russian Mafia very active in cyber thievery around the world. So a lot of these people are already in the business, but they're doing it for their own private gain. Now, the Russian police, the Russian government, the Russian state, they're not stupid. They get that. And in many cases, they know who these people are. In many cases, they will actually call the guy up and say, Sergei, see this document over here? That's an indictment with your name on it. We know you were a cyber criminal. We know that. But we're going to play Let's Make a Deal. And here's the deal. I'll take this indictment and put that in my left-hand drawer, provided that you use some of your skill sets, which are impressive, my friend, for the good of the motherland and for the good of what we're doing. Oh, you can still do your thievery stuff. And you can even keep the money. We don't really care. So like, instead of doing that 100% of the time, you can do it 60% of the time. And the other 40% of the time, you're doing stuff for us. And they're utilizing these people with great skill sets. These people have already learned how to do this because they're thieves. Now that gives the Russians a great pool of talent. And more importantly, it gives the Russians something that's even maybe more valuable. Plausible deniability. One of these guys gets caught, and occasionally these guys do get caught because they make a, a mistake by taking a vacation in the Seychelles, and we hear about it, and guess what? They arrive in the Seychelles, and they're met by a bunch of FBI agents who arrest them. It's happened a couple times. So these individuals weren't caught. The Russian government can say, oh, we don't, we don't have anything to do with that guy. As a matter of fact, that guy's a criminal. We actually have an indictment on this guy. We have a, here's a document. We, if, if, if you, don't, if you don't, well, don't want him, send him over to us. We'll, we'll put him in the Lubyanka. Well, not so much, okay? I mean, these guys are basically our guys, but they're, they're doing their own agenda, but they're working for us. So we know that there's RBN activities. We know that there's a relationship 
between the Russian security services and some of these RBN organizations, it's kind of hand in glove, hand in glove. Again, it's just part of what I call the Russian klepto state. And it blurs the lines between criminality and state-sponsored espionage, spying, and hacking. Um, and it works. It works. So this gives the Russians great leeway in providing and conducting cyber operations like they conducted here in, in 2016. And if you look at this whole thing as to why do the Russians do this, think about a couple things. Think about the word asymmetrical warfare, the concept of asymmetrical warfare. Um, when we think of warfare, we think of kinetic warfare. And when I think of, when I talk of kinetic warfare, I talk of bombs and bullets and things blowing up. Boom, 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 boom. Kinetic warfare. You know, bomb, you know bombers, aircraft carriers, paratroopers, all that good stuff. That's expensive. When I talk of asymmetrical warfare, I talk of maybe more discrete and nuanced ways to do things. I talk of ways to to conduct operations against an enemy, whether it a military enemy or a political enemy, without having to blow anything up. Well, I can fight that warfare. I can fight that war if I want in my underwear, in my basement, in front of my keyboard. I don't have to get in a tank. I don't have to get an aircraft carrier. I don't have to spend money. This, this actual concept of utilizing cyber as an element of asymmetrical warfare was proposed by two Russian generals on the Russian general staff about 15 years ago. And it was actually practiced as early as, as late as, depends how you look at it, 2007. In 2007, Russia went to war with Georgia. And before the first Russian soldier crossed over the LD, the line of departure, before he went on the march into Georgia, Russian cyber hackers took down the Georgian command and control systems, the C2 systems. The Georgian military was unable to talk to each other. They couldn't communicate with their higher headquarters. Ministry of Defense couldn't talk to, to the foreign ministry. Nobody could talk to the president. It was crippling to them. And when I was a student at the Army War College, we talked about something, a concept called Revolutions in Military Affairs, RMA. I would submit to you that the use of cyber in the Georgia-Russia War of 2007 was indeed a revolution in military affairs. That's the first time we saw that, really, in an actual conflict, a kinetic conflict. You now have this asymmetrical layer on top of the kinetic conflict. In the same year, we saw an attack in Estonia, a civil attack against the Estonian government, because the Estonians took down a statue called the Bronze Man of Tallinn. It was a statue from the Soviet era of a Red Army soldier standing there, and it was, and it was in, in, in memoriam to the Red Army soldiers who died and served in the liberation of Estonia from the Germans, and then the incorporation, of course, of Estonia and its Baltic neighbors into Great Russia, into the USSR. Well, the Estonians looked at that, really, as an, a monument of an oppressor. It's a conqueror's monument in their capital. You know what? We don't really want that. So they took it down. The Russians didn't like it. As a result, the Estonian government brought to its knees. Banking system, communications between government agencies, ministries, over. Russians said, we didn't do that. That was obviously done by people that were upset that you took the statue down. And where, the, where those people are and where they're from, we have the slightest idea. But that, that was their gig. We didn't do it. So we've seen this already, and we have seen Russia pouring money into their cyber capabilities with regard to these competing units, FSB, SVR, GRU. And again, understand that from a Russian viewpoint, I want you to think about this through the Russian viewpoint, this is a pretty good deal, because your country, Russia, doesn't have a lot of money right now. I mean, the, when you think about Russia and its GDP, which is, by the way, less than Italy's, you see a country that has measured its wealth mainly in petro rubles. Well, guess where the price of oil is right now? And guess where the price of natural gas is right now? Not so hot, not so much, down. So you have a cash crunch. It's expensive to buy new aircraft carriers. It's expensive to buy new ships. They're doing it. But you could get a better bang for your buck 
if you just put your money into cyber and go out and train some people and get some people. And you can project power internationally, again, by being in your underwear in your basement, typing away. You can, do, you can actually project power, and it's a lot cheaper. So the Russians are doing this to further their political and strategic aims. Now, I have to ask you, oops, and I want you to ask yourself, we know what happened. We know how it happened and how we knew that they did it. We went through the forensics a little bit. The question is, why would the Russians do this? And this is where I'm going to ask you to think and learn how to think like a Russian. In order to do that, you must know a little bit more about Russia than maybe you know. And to do that, let's talk about Russia. Let's start with this guy, Ivan IV, the terrible. He wasn't that terrible. He was, he was you know, he was for a middle, a, a, a 1589 kind of guy um, in a rough neighborhood, Muscovy, the Duchy of Muscovy in 1589, who had to kind of beat up some rivals. He was, you know, he was about as tough as he had to be. You couldn't be an, an, an easy guy in those days. But he was not a stupid man. Um, he, uh, he actually died of a stroke um, while he was playing chess. So he was literate. He could read. Um, he had a temper. Uh, he did kill his son, uh, beat him over, over the head with a, with a scepter, apparently, because he was upset with his son about something. Um, he was probably also bipolar, but nobody knew about being bipolar in 1589. So, you know, he was just a cranky guy, I guess. Stay away from the king. He's in a bad mood today. Um, so he is the guy that we will start with, 1589. And as I said to you before, if you look at Russia, it's a big country. But when he was running things, it was a small country. It was really just the little area around the city of Moscow, Moscovy. But if you look at Russia itself, it's a huge country. It, it stretches through 11 separate time zones. So from the Kamchatka, Kamchatka Peninsula, way over here, all the way to the far west of Russia, into the Kaliningrad Oblast, you go through 11 time zones. It's a big country. You fly over Siberia, and it seems to go on forever. You could drive, if that was the United States, you could drive through it like six times. It's that, it's that big. And think of this. The Russia of Ivan IV the Terrible, this little tiny enclave, grew for 350 years. And it grew at the rate of 500 square miles a day from 1589 until 1940. 500 square miles a day. Now, not, not every day, but think about that. Think of Peter the Great. Think of Catherine the Great. Think of Alexander the Second. Think of Nicholas II. Think of the wars, again, the Caucasus. Think of all these places like Armenia and Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan and Tajikistan, these places that were, were not under the czarist heel, but were taken over the years, 500 square miles a day, every day. Whoops, we're not here. We're not there yet. So in 1940, we have a pretty big country. And it's one-sixth of the world's landmass. Yet, as large as Russia is, it's a country that historically has been plagued by poor infrastructure, illiteracy, serfdom that ended in 19, 1860, a low GDP, high death rates, the life expectancy, average life expectancy of a man in Russia in 1900 was 30 years old. That's a tough place to live. It's had a feeble industrial base. It's had and still has, especially during the Soviet era, rampant pollution and environmental degradation. It's known as a country that is and has been for many years rife with government corruption and inefficiency. You want something done, you pay somebody off. And it's got a pretty bad human rights record all the way back from the czars. 
But as tough as that is to deal with, it's still a great country. Look at that, one-sixth of the world's landmass. And they projected power, especially as the Soviet Union. They helped win World War II. I would say that they suffered certainly more as a nation than this country did in World War II. They lost millions of people in World War II. But if you look at this country and you see how great it is, it has one issue. And I want you to think about this again through the eyes of a Russian. It has no real natural barriers. So if you're standing in the eastern Polish plains and you want to take your army and march eastwards into Russia and take a place like Moscow, there's nothing really to stop you. There's no mountains. There's some rivers, but they're not that bad. But you essentially walk across a flat plain for hundreds of miles until you take Moscow. And that's what this guy did in 1812. Now, he actually got into Moscow. He actually sat on the throne of the Tsar, and then he retreated. And the retreat was disastrous for him because he retreated during the winter. And while the Russian military couldn't defeat him, General Winter and the Russian mud and the freezing essentially destroyed the Grand Army of Napoleon as they marched back from Moscow through Poland and then back to France. But he marched in unimpeded. And in 1940, this guy did the same thing. And he didn't get to Moscow, but he got eight miles west. The Wehrmacht, the German army, and the SS units that were attached to the, the Wehrmacht divisions could see the domes, the onion domes of the Kremlin, eight miles in the distance. But they never got there. But they too suffered greatly on the retreat back as the partisans rallied in the forests and, and eventually took Berlin, and he died in, a, in the Fuhrer bunker. So you know that your country, historically, again, through the eyes of a Russian, you know that your country historically is vulnerable because you've been breached twice, and you never forget that. But you take, as a Russian, as a Vladimir Putin, you take comfort in the fact that your country, your great Russia, your motherland, your Rodina, oops, no, we don't want to see him anymore. Uh, you know that your homeland, the Russian Soviet Feder Federative Socialist Republic, Great Russia, White Russia, the heart, the Rodina, the motherland, is surrounded by the near abroad. And the near abroad are your buffer states. Remember the USSR had 15 Soviet Socialist Republics, Ukraine, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Armenia, Georgia, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Moldova, Moldova, Belarus, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and then lastly, Great Russia, the Rodina. And, and that, in the eyes of a Russian, provided you with a buffer zone. So if the, the Germans or the French or the Italians or the Portuguese or the M M Lichtensteiners wanted to invade your country again in the future, they've got to get through these other republics that act as a buffer to your homeland. But then in 1989, your buffer states go away. They become independent nations. So you lose the Kazakh SSR and Turkmen SSR and Uzbek SSR and Armenian SSR and Georgia SSR. They become independent nations. And to make things worse, some of them, especially up in the Baltics, not only become independent, they join NATO. They go to the other side. Again, think how you would feel as a Russian if all of a sudden that happened. Think how you would feel as an American if 14 of our states all of a sudden went away. That actually did happen to us, didn't it, in 1861, when the southern states left. And what do we do? We fought a civil war over that. It's, it's kind of a problem. So you've lost your buffer states. 
But then you have a further near abroad through the eyes of a Putin and the eyes of a Russian. In pre 1989, you have your Warsaw Pact. So you've got your Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, and East Germany that are your military allies providing a further buffer beyond your SSRs. But then in 1989, they go away too. And to make matters worse, they join NATO. I should have put the three blues up there with Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, but you get the, the point. So now your buffer states, your inner buffer is gone, your outer buffer is gone, and they've joined the bad guys in your eyes. Think of how you're feeling about that through the eyes of a Russian. Your country is being whittled away. Your country is being humiliated. And who's doing the, doing the humiliation? The West. And who's the West? The United States. NATO. So now you understand possibly why Vladimir Putin uttered his famous statement, the greatest strategic disaster of the 20th century was the destruction of the Soviet Union. Now, you might disagree with that. But if you're a Vladimir Putin, if you're a Russian, if you're a Czechist, and he's a Czechist, remember the Cheka? He's a Czechist. The Czechists are members of the Russian Security Service. He was a KGB case officer. Czechists believe that they're their sacred duty is to guard the homeland. That when all else fails, that when the country and everybody's throwing their hands up, you turn your, you turn your eyes. Russia turns her eyes. Mother Russia turns her eyes to the Czechists. They will come to the rescue. So in the eyes of Vladimir Putin, it was a disaster in 1989. And there he is. And so now you understand, I hope, a little bit about the mindset of the individuals who would decide to start breaching our society. Putin has been in power for quite a few years now. He will be running for election in a few years. He surrounds himself with a number of other Czechists, ex-KGB types, guys he worked with, people he trusts. Um, he, he did his time overseas in East Germany. He worked in Dresden. I actually uh, have a friend of mine uh, who's a, a retired CIA officer uh, who actually uh, met him uh, back in Dresden. Um, the CIA and the KGB would often have meetings. Um, it wasn't totally cloak and dagger stuff. They actually get together and have meetings. And they would deconflict issues, make sure people didn't get hurt. And, you know, maybe we'd need, need to trade people up, you know, I'll, we picked up one of your guys, you got one of our guys, we'll do a trade, nobody will know about it. And they'd had these meetings. And he went to a meeting in Dresden, where Putin was in attendance. And contrary to maybe most of our popular beliefs, Putin wasn't a big player over there. In matter of fact, he was kind of a gopher. And so while the station chief uh, from the KGB and the station chief in Berlin from CIA were having their meeting with their, with their deputies, Putin was kind of out of the room. But he would get called, and the guy would say, Putin, come in and it's like, get sandwiches. So we'd go out and get sandwiches. Putin, get some more water for these guys. He'd go out, fill, fill the glasses. Then he kind of ran away. So he was, he was a junior case officer at the time. Um, that's okay. Everybody has to start somewhere. He's done pretty well since then. Career's kind of gone on the up. So he's got this country whose wealth has been measured in petro-rubles, which ain't worth much right now. He's got a country that's very large and still has a lot of problems. They do not have a vibrant economy. He's got a country that, in many cases, has great potential, but has kind of fallen flat in their face post-1989. So he has to kind of keep his hands on this country. He's got a arrested underclass of people who a couple years ago were out in droves demonstrating against him. And he knows that they're there. So he has to kind of perform a little bit. He's got to deliver on a few things. He's got a limit to scent, certainly. He's got to jail critics, which he does do. Um, he's got to probably eliminate some critics, which allegedly he has done. People get assassinated over there. Journalists disappear. Journalists get killed. People that want to run against him get shot in the back of the head outside of the Kremlin. Um, he's got to distract 
his, his, his people from the source of the nation's ills. He's got to point to a boogeyman. We're the boogeyman. The West. At the same time he's doing this, he still has great expectations of greatness for Russia. He wants to see Russia come back to where it was. I get that. I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I mean, if I was a Russian, I, who wants to be like a, like a doormat of the world? You want your country to be great. Okay, so if you're, if you're Russia and you once were great, you want to kind of get that back. You want to kind of feel the love again. So he knows he can only do certain things because he's only got a certain amount of money. But where he sees opportunities, ladies and gentlemen, he will seize it. Where he sees chances to recapture that greatness, he will do so. Case in point, the Crimea. Okay, Crimea. Owned by, at that time, a couple years ago, Ukraine. Historically, owned by Russia. He took it. Why did he take the Crimea? Because he could. Because he could. It wasn't in our strategic sphere of influence. We weren't going to go to war with, about, about Crimea. We were involved in another war, in Iraq and Afghanistan. So he took it because he could. He takes an aggressive stance in the eastern part of Ukraine. Because again, not in our sphere of influence. Is the United States going to go to war over Ukraine? I doubt it. Is NATO going to go to war over Ukraine? I doubt it. So he continues this war. And this war still does go on in Ukraine. It might not be in the news, but there's still a lot of activity there. The little green men are still active. Um, they just built a, they are building right now a very large train line on the Ukrainian border that, that, that comes up to Ukraine. It could move a lot of armored divisions into Ukraine if they needed to do that. Again, he will take an opportunity where he can do it. When he sees an opportunity to weaken the West, such as NATO, he will do it. He will be more aggressive. He will challenge NATO in such manners as overflights over places like Scandinavia and Poland, aggressive tactics against U.S. warships and aircraft, ro robustly building his submarine fleet and probing the undersea waters of the North Sea and the Baltic Sea. He will reassert his role on the world stage where he can. Case in point. Syria, with this guy, Bashar al-Assad, MD, he's a doctor, eye doctor, by the way, trained in London, not supposed to become the leader of Syria, that was his older brother's job, but he got unfortunately killed in a car accident. So it kind of devolved down to the doc over here. So the doc who was basically, you know, writing people's eyeglasses prescriptions and, you know, checking out cataracts and glaucoma is now has a new job, which is a butcher and a dictator, um, and the president of Syria. Now, Russia has always had a relationship with Syria, with his father, as a matter of fact, Hafez al-Assad. Russia has had for many years a naval base in Syria, a place called Tartarus. Well, they've gotten a little bit more aggressive because now with Syria in flames and in turmoil, Russians, the Russians now have aircraft stationed in Syria running combat sorties against quote-unquote ISIS operatives who are probably not really ISIS operatives but they are most likely rebels challenging the, the challenging the president Bashar al-Assad and he's even gone so far as to try and revitalize the old Soviet blue water navy with the deployment of say again Today. Yes. Yes. So you have the deployment of the Admiral Kuznetsov, which is the only aircraft carrier the Russians have. It is frankly a bucket of bolts right now. It's, it's not a very operationally uh, sound air, um, um, aircraft carrier. Um, about a year ago, the uh, this aircraft carrier uh, lost the ability to. Uh, make potable water for their crew. They couldn't drink water from they were they take it from the sea and then they they desalinate and salinite desalinate it and they couldn't they couldn't make enough water for their crew. So they had to do the unthinkable and ask for potable water to be delivered 
in bladders from the U.S. Navy. That was rather humiliating for the Russians. I mean, I get it. I'd be humiliated too. But he put the uh, Kuznetsov in the Med off the Syrian coast to run uh, combat sorties into um, into Syria. So, so again, we see the beginning of the reassertion of the Russian bear. And um, I understand that. So again, why the presidential election? Why, why would they do that? Through the eyes of a Russian. Again, we are a country that is a great country. We have a great history. We've grown at a phenomenal rate. We suffered a disaster in 1989. We lost the Soviet Union. We lost our, our near abroad. We lost our buffer states. Our buffer states went to the other side. Now they're the Warsaw Pact. We have a, a lousy economy. Our petrodollars aren't worth much. We got to do something to get it back. We got to find out ways where we can compete and weaken our adversary. And so in 2016, with the election, something is delivered up that they didn't expect Hillary Clinton versus Donald Trump. Did, did Putin want Trump to win? I don't know. I mean, he didn't tell me. I don't know. Um, but <clears throat> how did he view Hillary Clinton? Not well. If you ever see some uh, film footage of, the me of meetings between Secretary of State, then Secretary of State Clinton, and President Putin, look at Putin's body language. He, he sits like this in a chair as she's talking like this. It's like a kid coming into like the principal's office and getting yelled at. I mean, you know, this is the Secretary of State. And he's like looking around, he's probably chewing gum. You know, if he had spitballs, he throws spitballs at her. I mean, his body language is very interesting. The guy hated her. The reason he really hated her was because when thousands of demonstrators were in the streets of Moscow saying Putin is a criminal, we got to get rid of Putin. Sec then Secretary of State Clinton was saying, in the press, in the media, on TV. You know what? They're right. He is a criminal. The Russian people should be out there demonstrating against this, this illegal regime run by a bunch of ex-KGB officers. I applaud, the, the, I applaud the, the courage of the Russian people. Well, look at that through the eyes of Vladimir Putin. How would you feel if somebody said that about you? She wouldn't be on your top 10 list of friends, would she? She's insulting you. She's telling people to throw you out of office. I'd be, I'd be annoyed too. I get that. So he didn't like her. Matter of fact, he hated her and he still does. He also looks at this guy, Trump, who maybe he never really doesn't know much about him. Um, probably was a target of, of KGB FSB interest back around 2008. But, you know, he hears some statements and, um, he hears statements like, you know, maybe uh, if elected, I will I'll lift the sanctions against Russia that were imposed after the invasion of Crimea. That's a pretty good thing. Or, you know what, that guy Putin, he's smart. I admire him. He's a powerful leader. That's a pretty good thing to hear. Then he hears like Trump's tepid support for NATO. You know, we don't, we don't even know if NATO is really worth keeping around. It might be, it's time may have passed. Well, NATO's an, an adversary to Russia. Then he talks about, I can work with President Putin. You hear that kind of stuff, so maybe he's thinking, hey, I could work with this guy, Trump. And if I had to choose, would I rather be a, a, across the con conference table from Hillary Clinton, who I hate, who has a career in public service, is experienced as a Former, former first lady, former senator from New York, and former secretary of state, where I want to go against a guy who is a New York um, real estate developer and kind of an entertaining guy. You know, he's on TV, you're fired, and he's got the Trump brand, but he's never had any experience in running a country. He's got no foreign policy experience. Maybe I want to throw my card behind that guy. I don't know. I have no idea. Did he want Trump to win? I don't know. But again, he's never been in the military. He's got no foreign policy experience. He's got no national security experience. Think about it. Who would you want as your adversary? Hillary Clinton, all her experience, and her husband, or Donald Trump, and Jared, and Ivanka.
<laughs> so, in the eyes of the Russian elites, in the eyes of a Vladimir Putin, in the eyes of a Czechist, in the eyes of a Russian intelligence officer, in my eyes, as a US intelligence officer, I strive to understand why they do what they do. I don't want to commit the cardinal sin as, as a, of an intelligence officer. It's called mirroring. When you look in the mirror, what do you see? You see yourself. You see the world and it comes like right back at you because you're looking at yourself. I want to see the world through his eyes. I want to make sure I understand why he does what he does. So, what can we expect going forward? Well, Russia is outgunned. Russia is weak economically. As I said earlier, Italy has a greater G GDP. Russia's population is shrinking. They have 144 million souls in Russia today. By the year 2100, they'll be down to 100 million souls in Russia. So their population is shrinking. shrinking. They have a demographic crisis. Their defense spending is a fraction of what our defense spending is. Russia knows that it can't beat us bomb for bomb, bullet for bullet, aircraft carrier for aircraft carrier in a fair fight. They'll lose, provided nobody shoots, shoots nukes. But Putin's playing his cards pretty well. He hasn't been dealt a great hand. But with what he's got, he's able to project power. I don't think there's going to be a chance of a military disaster between the two of us. I don't rule out that there will be more Russian adventurism in the near abroad. I don't rule out a possible incursion into Ukraine in the future. They're now getting ready to have their largest military exercise of 400 to 500,000 troops along their borders. It'll range from Ukraine all the way up to the Baltics. I believe that they'll continue to support the regime of Bashar al-Assad. I believe that they will continue to, where they can, kind of poke a stick in our eye. I believe that they will continue to, to barrage NATO with information operations, disinformation, cyber attacks, airspace violations, maritime incursions. They will attempt to undermine the nerves of NATO members and their confidence in NATO. They will continue to support the far right wing of Western Europe the Marine Le Pens of the world, those who are against immigration, those who, who are putting their own national borders up. Because the more you become insular, the less you become embracing. And so they see that as a weakening of NATO. So I think, again, Putin will run in 2018. He'll serve again until 2024. I think the adversarial relationship between the U.S. and uh, Russia is a fait accompli. I think it's here to stay for a while. And I think the West must be vigilant. I don't believe NATO is useless or a thing of the Cold War. In fact, I think NATO now needs to be strengthened. I think we need to cleave tightly to our NATO allies. A few months ago, the United States Army sent a BCT, a brigade combat team, from the 4th Infantry Division at Fort Carson, Colorado, and sent them to Zagan, Poland. These are tankers and heavy tanks. Um, they're there for about eight months. They'll be replaced by another BCT. We now have uh, National Guard units from the, around the United States doing their annual training in Lithuania, Estonia, and Latvia. Um, we, have, we have troops training with the Bulgarians and the Romanians. The Poles are very, very active in, in sounding the clarion call for more U.S. and NATO involvement because they see a menace coming from the East. So I believe we need to work closely with our NATO allies. Um, I think we have to continue information intelligence sharing. I think we have to be very, very aware regarding the continued cyber threats. And we need to meet those threats. Um, I do believe there needs to be load sharing among NATO. Uh, I, I do believe that most of those countries haven't um, uh, contributed their fair amount. And I think it's only fair that, that they do. And a lot of them are beginning to do that. 
So as I wrap this up, I do believe the Russians had a hand in the election. I do believe that the Russians had a hand in trying to compromise the new administration. I do believe that they continue to do this. Um, why wouldn't they do this? Why would they not do this? This is an incoming administration without a lot of experience in the game, in the political, the national security, the espionage game. They're, 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 they're newbies, and they're going to take advantage of that. And perhaps the most important slide, if any of you remember back in the 1960s, and I know those students don't, there used to be a TV show called Rocky and Bullwinkle. Remember that? Boris and Natasha. Tell them it's fake news, work of moose and squirrel. I just thought that was great. It comes out of the New Yorker. I want to thank you very much for your time today, and I enjoyed speaking to you. Again, I apologize for, for being late and making a mess of this. And I did water the plant a little bit, but um, uh, I want to thank you again for your time. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you very much. If anybody has any questions, I think that young lady does have a question. I'm here to here to answer. Yes, in, in the midst of uh, corruption and deception at home and abroad, think tanks are playing the idea that the threat in the time of liberal order. I contend the opposite. Given the context of what you're saying, all of these Eastern European countries and the collapse of the Soviet Union. They went west after making. Isn't that the success of the liberal order? But they have a chance to choose which side and they want to see. I agree. Uh, I agree. How the think tanks I, I don't know. I can't speak for the think tanks because they're way smarter than I am. But but I agree with you. I mean, I, I uh, my son just came back from uh, uh, from from Cuba. Um, he's twenty four years old, twenty five years old, college graduate hoping to go to Georgetown for the master's in national security uh, in, in next year. And he said, you know, dad, I spent, I spent 10 days in Havana and in Cuba. And I looked around and I thought to myself, this is the greatest advertisement for the failures of communism, what I see here. So I think you're right. I think in many cases that, um, I think that the, the liberal social order that we, we, we espouse in the West, I don't think it's, it's, it's falling apart. There's some problems, like there's always problems. Um, I think we, we could tone down our rhetoric some type, and our political rhetoric, the way, we, the, the way we are now arguing everybody, you know, you're completely wrong because you're on the left and you're completely wrong because you're on the right. I think we need to tone that down. I don't think that means the end of our, of our republic. I don't think it means the end of our, of, our, of our liberal democracy or the liberal democracies of the West. But there'll always be forces, dark forces or stupid forces that will be challenging what we've built over the last three or 400 years. Those forces will always exist. And I believe that we have to obviously believe in our, our liberal de democratic order. And I believe that, that the, in the long run, I believe that not American exceptionalism, but democratic exception, exceptionalism will still carry the day. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, I was interested to hear you say that you feel Putin will run in 2018. Yes. It will serve to 2024. Um, uh, the IW, uh, he has had um, speakers also who have speculated that, that uh, Putin is looking for an exit strategy now, personally, something along the Yeltsin line, you know, big payoffs, immunity from prosecution, and that it might be a, a tad before 2024. He'd be looking for the power to uh, develop that exit strategy by running in 2018. But given all of that, uh, Prior speakers have also indi indicated that there is that Putin is also um, starting to uh, develop a new generation from the provinces of potential leaders. Do you see s some names in that pack starting to emerge, or is it too early? I think it's a little early. Um, I, I don't think that uh, he needs a big payoff. He's got a lot of money. Um, if you look at, uh, when I was in office, we, I was, I was astounded. I, I got a CIA classified thing. I, I, I obviously can't get into depth, but it actually talked about the richest people in the world. And guess who's on the list? It's like Putin. Wow. That's pretty cool. I mean, he's up there with Bill Gates, you know, I mean, Warren Buffett, all those guys. 
Uh, yeah, yeah, like North. Yeah, and and when you think about it, it it's if you ever you ever watch the TV show the, the Sopranos about the mafia. Everybody, you know, every in that that show, no matter what you did, no matter if you were like a soldier in the mafia, the boss always got a piece. He always got his vig. You know, Tony Soprano always got a. There was always a piece for the boss, and that's that's how I view Russia. It's a klepto state. So he doesn't need a he doesn't need a payoff. Um, he don't, I don't think he needs immunity from prosecution at this point because I don't think the Russian state's going to be extraditing him anywhere. Um, I, I think you're right. I think like anybody else, he's 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 even older than I am, so he's bring, beginning to think about you know where he's going, what his what is what his life's going to look like. Um, he's divorced now. He's he's not married. Probably won't get married again. Um, and he is probably looking at people that can continue his legacy. I think you get to a point in, in your time in, in, in office, either as a U.S. president or any kind of leader, you want to think about your legacy. And I, I think he certainly doesn't want to get a guy that's going to retract what he did. Um, so, yeah, there's probably people, but nobody's really coming up yet. Um, CIA hasn't identified that's the guy. Um, there are probably a few guys out there, um, but he's still keeping a pretty tight tight hold on things. Yes, sir. That's right. And there's value in that. That itself is very valuable. Um, we've actually found, and that, you know, the final report on those state voting machines hasn't really come out yet. Um, but I haven't heard that there's been any evidence that said, you know, the state of Colorado had, you know, 4,000 votes for Trump that were really were Clinton votes and that they changed them. Nobody said that. Uh, in, in, in Virginia, where I vote, you, uh, you, we don't register by party. Yeah. Uh, for one thing, but the other thing is, is that when you go in, uh, to vote, you get checked, and then you're given a piece of paper to mark. That piece of paper, then, you put into a machine which tabulates it, but then the paper drops down into a closed container so that if there's ever any question, the, the officials can open the container That's right. and check it. I, th I think the Russians also. No, no way the Russians get right, right. <clears throat> I think the Russians also looked at possibly the U.S. voting system as possibly fragile, because they didn't forget that uh, a few presidential elections ago, um, election was decided by a bunch of hanging chads in the state of Florida. So I think, looking through their eyes, they probably thought, you know what, those they don't have, they're not that squared away in some of those states. Yeah, I think that's why they're yeah. 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 Questions? Hands? Yes, ma'am. That's kind of related questions. What do you think about the effectiveness of Obama's response in 2016 to the to the hack the hacking of evacuating to the question of mansions and where they were and um the sanctions? And then secondly, what do you think Putin's uh and or what's your analysis of what Putin's interpretation is of Trump's friendliness to him, um, and how do you think, if do you think he'll try to exploit that? In sure. Um, I I don't really I don't really have anything damning to say about uh, President Obama's response uh, to this hacking for a couple of reasons. Um, it, it, you know, Obama left office in January of 2017. Um, a lot of the forensics weren't really out yet. They were kind of coming out, but there was a, there's still a lot of work to be done here. I mean, there's still a lot more data that's being gathered. So I would say, you know, giving work, having worked in government, knowing how slow things work in government at times, I would say that that they maybe kept their powder dry, the Obama people, because they didn't get all the data that they needed, and then they were out of office. So um, I mean, I I would I would I, I'll give them the benefit of that doubt. I don't think it was politically motivated. Like, well, we're, I just don't think it was. I mean, I think Obama had his eyes on other things like going to Tahiti and, and you know, doing windsurfing and stuff like that. 
um, and taking some time off and making money on a, on a big book book deal. Um, so I, I don't think, I don't see it was a political thing. I, I just don't. Um, I think that was still a, a, it was still an issue that was still evolving. So that's one. The second thing, um, will Putin take advantage of Trump's friendliness to him? Um, I would say yes. Um, remember, don't forget, Vladimir Putin was a case officer, a human intelligence case officer. And I know how those people were trained. And, and don't forget, one of, the, one of the first things that George W. Bush, my president, m- my guy that I serve in his administration, said about Vladimir Putin was that I looked into his eyes and I, I thought I looked into his soul and he was a good man. I looked into his eyes and I saw KGB. Yeah, yeah. And then Bob Gates said, I looked into his eyes and I saw a stone cold killer. And, you know, those guys are good. Uh, and case officers are really good at what they do. They're, they're, they're friendly people. They can, <clears throat> they can, they can talk, a, uh, talk a dog off a meat wagon if they want to. So I, w- I would say that... <clears throat> Vladimir Putin will use whatever skill sets he's learned as a case officer, as an intelligence officer, as a leader, as a politician. And he's a tough politician. We know that. He will use whatever he can to get the upper hand on what he probably views as a fairly naive president who's never been in office before, who's never held any political job in his life, and who has, I would say, a tendency maybe to say some things when he shouldn't, like, you know, tweet when he shouldn't be tweeting. And so I, I think he looks at this like, hey, this guy's like, this guy's like ripe for me. I can, I can pick this guy. So yeah, I think he'll, I think he'll try to do that. Why wouldn't he? Um, and again, again, a president that has no schooling in this and is maybe known to possibly shoot his mouth off inadvertently, or maybe oh, I wish I hadn't said that. I would say, I would say Putin looks at him as, as, as ripe for the picking. Yes, sir. Uh- can you comment on the uh, uh, Russia-China relations, especially regarding North Korea? Sure. Um, I think the Russia-China relations have always been problematic. They're, they're not. I mean, they're not enemies, but they're. I would say they're uncomfortable neighbors. They've been uncomfortable neighbors for many years. Um, in 1969. Uh, the People's Army uh, of uh, China and the Red Army of Russia fought a border war on the Amur River. So they've had they've had they've had issues in the past. Um, I, I think they they both they're both big countries. They both have um, vast uh, appetites uh, for power in their region, and they happen to sit next to each other. So I, I think the Russians and the Chinese will continue to have a. Uh, not a cold war. It's not a cold war. It's cold peace, maybe. They're, you know, they're, they're, they're professional. They're businesslike, but they're always watching each other very carefully. Um, I think North Korea presents another problem uh, entirely. Um, I look at North Korea as the country, um, and it's been called the country of no good option, no good options, especially with the re- with the rise of their their nuclear capability. Um, I do believe that to some extent. The, the one country that holds the, the Trump card, no pun intended, in that area of the world are the Chinese with regard to North Korea. I think they have the most influence over North Korea. I think the Chinese um, have a lot to lose if things go badly for North Korea. I don't think they want to see a uh, Kim Jong-un's regime go away um, or be destroyed because then they'll have a Korea right up on their border on the Yalu River, that is a in the Western camp. It'll be a unified Korea. And they'll also have a huge refugee crisis with people running across the border that they don't need. Um, but at the same time, I think that could possibly work to our benefit because I think, I do believe we still need to enlist the Chinese to find a solution for North Korea. And I don't think Kim Jong-un is a crazy man. People always say, oh, he's a crazy man. That guy in North Korea, he's crazy. I don't think he's crazy at all. I think he's crazy like a fox. Yeah, I don't think he's crazy. I mean, if I'm the, if I'm Kim Jong Un and I've got nuclear weapons and I'm building it an ICBM capability, that's my insurance policy, in my eyes. I know of two guys that had weapons of mass destruction, gave them up. One guy's named Saddam Hussein, 
other guy's name, Muammar al Qaddafi. Well, Hussein ended his situation at the end of a rope. Qaddafi died in a rain culvert. Ukraine. What's that? And Ukraine. And Ukraine. Yeah. Yes, yes. And what happened to them? They were getting pushed around now. Excuse me. Jay Braithwaite. Aye, aye. Oh, it's the president. I'd get that go to go to voicemail on that one. Um, anyway, um, you would say, he's, except he's uh, on the high end of unstable, though, in terms of unpredictable. I think his unpredictability is as part of his strength. I mean, I don't think he, I don't know if he's unstable or not. I don't know enough about the guy. I mean, we we don't know enough about the guy. I think the, the South Koreans know the most about him. Certainly, they would. Why wouldn't they? Um, but you know, if he's crazy, let's hope he's not crazy. Because you don't want a crazy guy to have nuclear weapons. I mean, that's a bad thing. So I, I think he looks at this as his survival card. It's a way for him. It's a way for him to stay in power. And I don't believe in his heart of hearts he really cares a whole lick about the North Korean people. I think he cares about his life. And as long as he has his French wine and champagne and Russian hookers, he's pretty happy. Um, his dad was like that. That's kind of the way it's been. His grandfather was actually a pretty good fighter. Um, he, he fought very, very, very admirably against the Japanese in World War II. He was a good leader. Um, and he happened to go over to the, 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 the communist side as opposed to the capitalist side. But he was probably the most capable of the three of those guys of, in, the, in the family tree. Um, but I think he is ruthless. And I, I don't even know, I mean, I'm not even sure exactly if he calls all the shots in North Korea. He may, or there may be a bunch of generals who have a vested interest in keeping things the way they are. That kind of say, "Okay, we'll we'll support you." You know, you're the you're the you're the you're the family guy, but don't 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 step out of line. He's a tough guy, um, but I don't think he's crazy. I don't think he's crazy. Yes, sir. So if you were still in your same role at DHS, yes. Yes. What specific recommendations or policies would you push for in order to make sure that we're actually stronger against? this threat today? Sure. Um, I understand that my area was intelligence. So I, I don't, you know, I, I can't go into like TSA and airplanes landing and stuff like that. Um, I would say certainly that, that for, for us to be, uh, if I were still in office, I was doing the job that I had, I would, I would certainly say that we, we need to continue um, with regard to the war on terrorism. Um, we need to continue to fight that war. And I, I think the best way to fight that I mean, there's always a good way to fight it with by blowing people up and bombing ISIS guys and things like that. But it's, in my opinion, it's it's intelligence. It's 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 getting as much intel on your adversary and your enemy, and and sharing information at the at the at the highest levels, sharing it between state and local governments, sharing it with our allies, uh, making sure that we build trusted relationships with our allies, and that when people leave a job. It doesn't. We don't have to start over again with a new guy coming in, and you know we don't. We're not talking to you. Um, I, I just believe that so much can be done through through intelligence, and it's it's. Yeah, I I don't you know I don't I don't condone uh, spying on Americans, or you know I don't I don't believe the NSA should be doing that. I don't think they did it. There may have been some violations of that in the past, but I think that that a, a robust international or national intelligence uh, directorate like 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 the DNI, which is not robust. Um, in my opinion, a robust national intelligence director should be uh, continued to be. We need to build that. We need to strengthen. We need to hire better people. We need to hire more people. Um, I, I think personally, we 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 do ourselves a disservice in our own security clearance area. I know people that um, can't get hired by the intelligence community because they have they were born overseas or they have too many foreign connections. I look at that as I look at that as as, as a positive. Uh, my senior intelligence officer. Um, was named um, Mustafa Javed Ali, my senior intel officer. You know, you know, what, you know what his biggest passion was in life? University of Michigan football. He's an American. Okay, he happened to be from Pakistan. His parents were born there, but he grew up in Dearborn, Michigan, and he's an American. And I would trust that guy with my life because he's a patriotic American. And the fact that he could speak four languages, languages I couldn't speak was a huge asset to us. So, you know, I look at those kind of people as not people that we should fear. They're, they're people we want to embrace. So. So, <clears throat> you're saying that the Russians supported the Russian death celebrity with a very different definition of cybersecurity. For example, in the United States, people think that cybersecurity is about network security, more the kinetic aspect of cybersecurity. 
But the Russians have to think can quote one like information in what they ask them. The Russians exploited that and section that when they grew up in the I think the Russians uh, I do I think the Russians look at Oh yes. Okay. Um how do I how do I how do I rephrase that question? Why don't you come up here and ask that question again? Come on up here, because you had a really good question, all up. But I, I know what I want to say, but I I, I can't and I can't paraphrase you. So the question was basically about the perception gap surrounding the you know definition of cybersecurity. Uh, here in the United States, people tend to think about cybersecurity more as a you know physical security issue, such as you know network security, you know server security, and what have you. In Russia, people tend to think of cybersecurity more of a um, you know part of information warfare. Um, as far as I know, the Russians don't have a vocabulary for uh, cybersecurity. They use information warfare to refer to cyber uh, warfare. So that's my understanding, and uh, that was my question for you, sir. Okay, I, I think the Russians uh, view uh, the cyber realm as a as a place for collection. They collect everything. The Chinese do the same thing. Um, they collect everything. Chinese have my all my personal data data because my my SF eighty six for my security clearance was it o, was it OPM Office of Personnel Management and that was all sucked out by Chinese intelligence service. Um, and and I look at uh, the Russians as very holistic. In their collection efforts, and it's it's way be about much more than they're very good technically. They're good at that, but they look at things like the Chinese holistically. They want everything they can get on me, on you, on our, on, on 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 our society, and even if it's something that is like useless on its face, like who cares about my medical records? Well, they might have them, and they'll put them up there to be used later. Maybe never, but maybe they will be important. So if that answers your question, I just think their I think their collection is very robust. And, you know, they look at that they, they can get data from Colorado and, 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 and voting booths in, in Arkansas, who cares about a voting booth in a county in Arkansas, but it might be it might fit into some mosaic in the future. That's how I would answer that question. Say, um, I I have you know observed the same differentiation you know in, in different situations. Like here in the U.S., we have the example of the election mechanisms themselves being the you know the, you know, the, you know, the hacking. But then you also have this story about information being spread, be they you know false news stories or what have you, by social media and. Um, I want to know what you think about how active you think Russia really is in that realm, especially here in the U.S. Um, I think they're very active. Um, we call that direct action. A lot of that. I think you're going to see a new world order, so to speak. I hate to use that, but a, a new world. Um, I think what we've seen in the last election. I think what we continue to see with this whole fake news thing, you know, work of moose and squirrel. Um, we're going to see a lot more of that. Um, I, I saw this one thing recently, which kind of really blew me away. Um, and I saw it before, um, but it was a an interview with President, former President George W. Bush, and there he was being interviewed about something, but he was never interviewed about this. It was not him, but it was him. I mean, it was him. It was his voice. It was him. It was it was it was him. The whole thing was it was an actor, and they were able to layer on this actor, his the way he answered these questions, all these movements. They layered on George Bush. I mean, this actor became George Bush. And that's fake news. That's a, that's a, that's a, a you know, there's an, an interview of a, a former president that never took place. I think you're going to see things like that in the future coming down the pike as what we call direct action in the future, used by intelligence services, used by social media companies, used by uh, politicians, used by political operatives, used by people that are, that are hired, media firms that are used to, as maybe oppo guys. I think this is like open to floodgate. I don't think it's good, but it's it's a new world we're going to be living in. Um, the first time I ever saw that was in a movie called Forrest Gump. You ever see Forrest Gump? Do you remember that one scene where he's getting his Medal of Honor and he's by Kennedy, and and Kennedy's putting the Medal of Honor around his neck, and and then 
he says, well, and Kennedy says, do you have anything to say? And, and Gum says, I have to go pee. Remember that? And, he, and Kennedy goes, I think he said he has to go pee. And it's John F. Kennedy saying that. It wasn't John F. Kennedy saying that. The whole thing was, was completely fabricated by technology. And that was like 12 years ago. And imagine how much better things are now. So I think you will see, I think you do see this whole fake news stuff as a new type of direct action in the toolkit of a nation state that wants to either project influence or project power or, or influence something in, either, in the world or in an adversary state or in the political spectrum. I really think you're seeing that. And I, I don't think it's going to go away. Sir, you mentioned your uh, the policy in regards to terrorism that you think America um, should follow. And I understand you're uh, an intel uh, guy, but I'm wondering if you were Putin, what, what kind of responses from America would be the most effective? I think if I were Putin, I think, it, I, it would, I think an effective response by us would probably not to end uh, sanctions that were imposed after Crimea. I think if I were Putin, an effective response uh, by us would be uh, continuing to strengthen our military uh, relationships with our Eastern European NATO neighbors. I think if I were Putin, an effective response by us would be pushing uh, our, putting our troops as far east as possible, not everybody, but just to, to show him that we, uh, we believe that it's important. Places like Poland and Estonia and Latvia and Lithuania are important. Um, if I were Putin, I would think that uh, um, I would think that I just won when the United States decided that we are going to end uh, CIA support to uh, rebel forces in Syria, which came out in the paper today. I would think that that's that's a victory for the for the Russians. Um, I understand that I understand that there has been a desire, uh, this administration to, to, um, and under the last administration, I remember Hillary Clinton had this thing that was a, they wanted to reset that little reset button, bam, hit it. They, they never did reset relations with Russia. They actually got worse. Um, I understand that th this new president wants to possibly explore better relations. I'm saying that's a good idea, but it just comes down to my what I know in the past and what I know the Russians have done and what they still do. Um, I mean, I don't blame them for what they do and through their eyes, but I can't say I trust them. And so I, I feel that that we we have to we have to meet challenge with challenge. Our response has to be there. And, and if we look if we look like we're weaklings, if we look like we're we're going to back down, I'm not saying we we fight them or anything, but if we if we if we kind of go step back off our game, I think he takes advantage of us. I think the guy's a meat eater. I mean, he didn't get to where he got to be by being a nice guy. I'm not saying he's Stalin, but you know, he admires Stalin. In the back. Uh, you discussed that Russia maintains the anti-West position. Anti-who? Anti-West. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just curious how you see this playing out with North Korea and the relationship between Russia and, uh, and China. As you've mentioned, we don't really see them having a dynamic relationship right now. Um, but if we see North Korea continue to take um, elevated steps against the U.S., do you see them having more of a relationship? And uh, is that something we should be concerned about? With it? the Russians? With, between Russia and China. Um, I, I don't think that, the, I, I think the Russians are smart enough to realize that uh, continuing tension between the United States and North Korea is not in anybody's interest. Uh, I don't think the Russians want to see a war in Northeast Asia um, because North there people will die. I mean, a lot of people will die if the if, if the North Koreans, even if they don't use nukes, th they've got like 25,000 artillery tubes facing South. Um, and, and it's only 38 miles from the deep, from the North Korean border to, to um, Seoul. So uh, people will die. And, the North Koreans will lose that war. And I don't think the Russians want to see a, 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 a united Korea as a strong new regional power in their backyard either. So I think it's in the Russians' best interest 
to say, you know what, I'd rather have North Korea stay as North Korea, maybe be a little less aggressive. And if the, if the United States is willing to work with them and the North Koreans back down, I think the Russians would be, would be on board with that. I mean, it wouldn't surprise me to see a, an agreement somewhere brokered. Okay, you can keep your nukes, but you got 20, that's it, no more. You've got to agree to uh, no notice inspections by the U.S. and by the U.N. You've also got to agree to um, limit your aggressive activities with, against the South Koreans. You can't go whacking people out. You can't go torpedoing South Korean uh, frigates and killing 25, 28 sa sailors. Um, you can't have hit teams going out and killing your relatives. Um, you've got to kind of behave yourself. And in exchange for that, here's what you get. You get a treaty ending the Korean War. You get recognition of North Korea as a state by the United States. You get a U.S. embassy in Pyongyang. Now, people say, wow, that's pretty big. Well, and you also get a, 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 a promise that the U.S. won't seek regime change. Those are the things we kind of promised, not all of them, to Cuba after the Cuban Missile Crisis. So um, I think the Russians could deal with that. Um, so I, I think that if presented in the right way, it's going to be difficult to do all this. But if, 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 if it's presented in the right way and negotiated in the right way, I think the Russians go along with that. I think the Chinese do too. So I don't think anybody wants to see what could really go wrong over there. Nobody wins on that. Who? North Koreans? They have broken everything. Absolutely. Absolutely. But you know what? It, it, there's always, again, and, and during the Cold War, we talked about MAD, mutually assured destruction, right? With Kim Jong-un, I would talk about AD, assured destruction, his destruction. I don't think he wants to die either. I don't think he wants to be dead. I don't think he wants his regime to be go, to go away. I think you have to, it's a very, very difficult problem. It's got to be handled with kid gloves and possibly a stick in the back, but it's got to be handled very carefully. Because you're right, he has a very bad reputation of breaking promises. So you've got to make the promise breaking serious enough, the consequences that you get his attention. And you've got to have a, a carrot out there too. I mean, look, I don't get paid the big bucks to do that. So, But I think it's a fascinating and a difficult challenge that we have in that country. More carrots and maybe some bigger sticks. But, I mean, you've got to find one way to make them. Again, what's this? What's important to him, and why does he want to have an ICBM? Does he want to take out Hawaii? Does he want to take out Los Angeles? I don't think he does. Because if he does, he's done. I mean, it's over. He's dead. I don't think he wants to be dead. So I don't think he's crazy. So if you want, I mean, it'll, it'll take thirty-two minutes from a mi from a missile to go from North Korea to Los Angeles, and he could kill a couple million people. But if he does that, it's it's curtains for him unless he's got some suicidal desire and i don't think he does there's got to be one way to there's got to be some way to reach this guy and say you know if it comes down to existential and it's going to be your existence will be over he wants to honor his grandfather sure he does that's not the way to do it though i mean your, your grandfather built this country so the way to honor your grandfather is destroy it i don't know that's why we have like CIA psychologist trying to figure this guy out. Questions? Okay. Thank you very much.